Hi, students, and welcome to today's live IELTS class. My name is Adrian, and I'm streaming to you live from beautiful Budapest here in Hungary. I hope everybody had a great week and is looking forward to a fantastic weekend. Hi, Kiran. Hi, Acrophobia Bliss. You're scared of heights. Uh, Nock Ravi. Hi, just Breed. Good to see a member in the class. Uh, students, uh, we are looking at listening parts three and four today, some practice and some strategies to get those high band scores, high violet new in. While we wait for a few more of your peers, this lesson is brought to you by aehelp.com. For academic IELTS help, check us out there. And for general, check us out at g-i-e-l-t-s-help.com on both of these interactive web portals. We have a lot of great materials for you. This is what our academic website looks like here with the blue background. We'll use this today. Click that big red button to join the premium package with over a hundred hours of HD video lessons, six original practice exams, and a fully interactive course for your phone, tablet, PC, as well as applications. Hi, Himan. Nice to see you in this class as well. Preeti, good to see you. Uh, this is the general IELTS website here with the green background. Click that big red button to join us there. Of course, this website focuses on the general IELTS exam, so different reading and writing sections and instructions. If you have questions about our products, just send me an email, adrian at aehelp.com, and I will gladly answer any questions that you may have. Tomorrow, a question and answer session for members. So members, make sure you have your questions ready for tomorrow's class. And then we'll have a speaking part two class for everyone. All right, students, we'll get right into it today. So this is section three taken from our second exam uh, on the website. And uh, I'm going to uh, play the audio here in just a moment. Before I do, a couple of important points. Uh, please, students, do not write your answers into the chat. Write them on a separate piece of paper or in a separate document just to give everybody a fair chance to answer on their own. And uh, the volume is max on my end. So if it's quiet for you, turn up the volume or use a headset, okay? All right, so uh, we're just gonna hop over to our academic website here. I'm going to uh, log into my student account. And then once I'm in my student account, I'm going to end my tour of all of my wonderful materials and open up the uh, audio CD tab. And this will be CD2, track three. So I hope, again, everybody's ready uh, to listen, pay attention, do the best to answer. We'll go over the answers together at the end. Please do not put your answers into the chat. Don't confuse your fellow students, okay? All right, here we go, everyone. Now turn to section three. Take some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Listening section three. You will hear a student and her professor talking about their class. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Come in, Laura. Thanks a lot for making the time to see me, Professor Gorman. As I mentioned in my email, I've been very ill this past week and missing the first week of school is not a good way to start the term. Indeed, it's not a very good start at all, but I think you can overcome it. You had a good grade in my course last term and I'm sure this absence is just a bump in the road as far as this term goes. Now, what would you like to discuss? 
Well, I don't even have a syllabus, so maybe you could give me one and then we could go over it in some detail. Yes, that would be sensible. Let me grab your syllabus. Here you go. As you see, the class meets each Monday and Thursday from 10 to 11.30 in room A313 of the Juliet Building. Do you know where that is? Yes, the Juliet Building is right next to the Student Union Building, correct? Yes, that's right. OK, so next are my office hours. I hold them each Monday and Wednesday from 2.30 to 4 in the afternoon. If these do not work for you, feel free to send me an email and we can make arrangements to meet at another time. Now, let's discuss the books you'll need. As you see on the syllabus, there are two books you'll need for this course. You need not purchase either of them, however, as there are several copies of each available in the library. I like keeping my books for future reference, so I would prefer to buy both books. Are they available in the bookshop? The first one is, but the second one must be purchased from Buster's Books. Do you know where Buster's Books is located? Roughly, but do you have an address? Yes. The address is 3419 Young Street in Brighton. Right, I know where that is. Do you know how much the books cost, approximately? I think the one at the University Bookshop is about £20, and the one at Buster's is about £15. So that's a total of £35 for the two of them. You now have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen to the rest of the discussion and answer questions 27 to 30. Great. Can we talk a little about the coursework required? Of course. There are two essays, one midterm exam and one final exam. Wow, that's a lot of coursework. Yes, but at this level I don't believe in just having one essay or one final exam determine your entire mark in a class. I like arranging it so that a student can have a chance to reflect on their ability and understanding of materials throughout the term. That makes sense. So what are the percentages associated with each assignment and exam? The first essay is worth 15%, the second is worth 25%, the midterm exam is worth 20% and the final exam is worth 40%. Would you like to talk about the first essay? It is due next Friday. Yes, could we? Of course. The essay should be approximately 1,500 words and the topic must be chosen from the list. And can I get a copy of the list? There is one attached to your syllabus. Right. So do we have to tell you what topic we are writing on beforehand? No, it's all right. You only have to notify me if you want to do a topic that is not on the list. Right. Is the essay due in class or can we submit it by email? I will accept essays without penalty until midnight after the class it's due. So, yes, you can submit it by email, hand it in during class or submit it to the department office. If you submit it to the office, make sure to get a timestamp put on it so that I can be sure the paper was submitted on time. And also, be sure to make... That is the end of section three. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. Okay, students, and use that half minute to check your answers. Make sure you didn't make any silly little mistakes with spelling or the instructions. That often happens, and students lose one or two critical marks, and then their band score goes down. Uh, let's do this together. So I'll brighten the screen a little bit for this first question. I think I can go a little bit brighter. Let's see. How's that? Uh, I darkened the screen, obviously, for this brighter form completion that we have. So, um, Okay, so I'll stay in the dark for now. Uh, let's do this together, okay? Um, so uh, number 21, choose the correct letter A, B, or C. This is multiple choice. When you're doing multiple choice in the uh, listening section, you really have to pay attention to uh, the question, okay? Not the answers, but the question. 
So why does the student go to see the professor? A, she has been in the hospital. B, she has been ill. C, she registered late. Yeah, she's been ill, that's right. Bonus question, how long has she been ill? So let's see how many of you are paying real careful attention here. So she's been ill, B is correct. For how long has she been ill? How much uh, of the uh, semester did she miss? Okay, you should always push to go above and beyond the questions, okay? I believe it was one week. Okay, so it was one week, I believe. It was one week. They're in the second week of classes right now. Okay, I seem to remember one week, but if you're not sure about the answers uh, for these questions, one place that you can always check is the transcripts. The transcripts will guide you when you're not sure about your answers. So make sure to use transcripts as you need them. In this case, the transcripts are found in our book on page 183. And uh, here it is. So uh, we'll put this argument to the rest. Um, professor says, come in, Laura. Laura says, thanks a lot for making time to see me, Professor Gorman. As I mentioned in my email, I've been very ill this past week and missing the first week of school is not a way, uh, not a good way to start the term. So indeed, it's one week, okay, one week, missing the first week of school, all right? So uh, just a quick tip here, students. Two points, two important points that I just mentioned to you here. Um, tip one, when you are uh, practicing your listening before the exam, especially in class or with partners, go above and beyond the questions in the exam and challenge each other for more detailed information. It's a really good way to uh, hone and sharpen your active listening skills. So sharpen those active listening skills. Uh, tip number two is when you're not sure of an answer while practicing before the exam, do use the transcripts located at the back of quality IELTS exam books, such as ours, okay? So keep those two in mind, keep those two tips in mind, okay? All right, let's go jump back from the transcripts to the actual questions on page 86, and then we'll go through the other ones here. So this was a uh, form completion. In fact, you were completing your syllabus, okay? Uh, know this word, syllabus, S-Y-L-L-A-B-U-S. Uh, the syllabus is the outline uh, for your classes, especially for those of you who are uh, going to study uh, in US, Canada, Australia, or some English speaking country, okay? So uh, syllabus, you need to have a syllabus. Every class starts with a syllabus. It gives you an idea of what the course is about and the details of where, when, like this one here, okay? All right, class times, number 22, when is it? I can see a lot of uh, students jumping the gun. Uh, it's on Monday. The M has to be big. Okay, M, uh, Monday. Uh, you can use abbreviations in the IELTS, so you can do this. Okay, that's also a correct answer. Uh, Monday, spelt with a small M, would be wrong. Okay, careful with that. Uh, Monday, 
spelt all uppercase is also okay. All right, so those are right. Uh, students, try not to jump the gun. Um, you're not trying to prove yourself to other people. You're proving yourself to yourself, okay? Uh, so don't jump the gun. I think that's the fourth time uh, that I used that idiom, so I will teach that to those of you who don't know it. Uh, don't jump the gun. It means do not start or advance before the official request or time. It comes from running races. where the gunshot starts the race. And if you jump the gun, you get a penalty, <laughs> all right? Okay, so uh, keep that in mind. Uh, if my voice is low, Puvaness, I think it's on your end. If other people are having a, that kind of a problem too, let me know, okay? All right, if my voice is low, turn up the volume. Okay, here we go. Uh, location, so uh, they say this answer twice. Uh, when it's a little bit tricky, like a name, they will often repeat that. So um, the professor says the location of the building, and then the student, the woman, also says, oh, I know where that is. Um, that's beside the student union building. Okay, and the correct answer is Juliet. Uh, like Romeo and Juliet. This is the English spelling, but we do use the French uh, spelling as well. So if you spell it in the French way like this, they'll take that because we use that in English also. Okay, so with a stronger T sound, Juliette. So both of these spellings would be correct. Uh, the IELTS does expect you to kind of know some of these common names in English like uh, Juliette and uh, Mike, Tim, so on, how to spell those. Okay. All right, number 24, I can already see some students are jumping the gun, color tune. I know there's a little bit of delay, live streaming isn't perfectly real time, but a little bit slower students. So uh, Monday and Wednesday from 2.30 till 4 are the office hours. That's right, Rajbir, very good, office hours, two words. Uh, bonus. Okay, so again, let's see how well you're paying attention. Um, bonus question. Uh, can a student see the professor outside of the office hours? So is it possible for a student to uh, talk with this professor outside of office hours? Ferdov says, yes. Okay, very good, for Dobbs, you're paying attention. Um, and um, office time is probably acceptable, but office hours is better. Uh, if I want to see the, pro uh, the pro professor outside of the office hours, what do I need to do? Yeah, very good, Aisa Sharifi. So Aisa Sharifi says yes, but they need to send an email. Very nice. So that's what we call active listening. Okay, when you're able to recall and answer questions above and beyond these blanks. Okay, so yes, they can, but they need to send an email. Okay, good, 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 good. Great job, students. So here we go, uh, the required books. Book one is available at the bookshop. What's the cost? Number 25. So... Book one, you can get it at the bookshop. How much does it cost? How much, what's the uh, cost of, uh, of, book, of book number one? It's 20 pounds, very good. So 20, you only need the number 20 because you have the symbol for pounds. If you see the symbol, you do not need to write that into the answer key. So just the number uh, 20, okay. Um, do the students have to buy the books? Bonus question. Do the students have to buy the books? Wedge here, it's not 20%, it's 20 pounds. The symbol is there, okay? 
So only 20. Um, yeah, Yalin says no. No, they don't. Yeah. Uh, why not? Why don't they have to buy the books? So again, I'm testing your active listening. Why don't they have to buy them? Yalin says that the stu this student prefers to buy them. And Hemant uh, says, because they're in the library. Very good. Excellent. Okay, uh, book two is available at Something Books. Uh, where? Number 26. Where is that available? So where is the second book available? Very good job, students. You picked up that these books can be borrowed from the library. Okay. Kalitun, great, well done. Buster's Books, okay. Buster's Books, very good. Buster's Books. So Buster's, okay. Um, Buster's Books, obviously a big B. It's the name of a bookshop. We know that because notice how this B is also big. So Buster's Books. Uh, if you write it like this, Buster's Books, with the apostrophe, that's also correct because we don't know if it's busters like plural or if it's busters with uh, showing possession. So both is okay. Busters books. Heman, it's totally fine. Just be really careful with typos uh, in the exam. And students, be very careful with typos if you're doing the computer-based exam, okay? So uh, typos are more common when you're typing. That's why we call them typos, okay? So, uh, Hemant, I'm actually kind of glad that you did that because that's an important tip uh, for uh, students. And I'll use that uh, example, Hemant, as my tip number three for today. So be extra careful uh, of typo mistakes if you are sitting for the computer-based exam in both the listening and reading sections, okay? So it's, uh, there's a much uh, higher probability of typos in the computer-based exam. A good idea is to double-check your answer. Okay. especially with these kinds of words like uh, busters books. Okay. All right. Um, so here we go uh, with uh, the second half of this uh, listening with the coursework. Okay. So coursework, first essay, 15%. Uh, second essay, 27. What percentage is that? All right. And again, I can see students... Uh, jumping the gun. Um, second essay is 25%. Uh, That's right. Uh, we know that because 40 plus 20 is 60, uh, plus 25 is 85, plus 15 is 100%. So by doing a little bit of math, we can even guess that this is 25%, which brings me to my next tip. Uh, don't panic, use logic, okay? Uh, never panic if you miss an answer. Or two, remember to keep calm and jive on. Nope. Keep calm and focused. Apply logic when you have the chance. Okay, that's the key. That's the key. So logic can help you. Um, so that's 25%. And then uh, number 28, so this is 40%. What is 40%? And again, it makes sense uh, if you use logic for this, okay? So Final exam, yeah, and you don't have to write percent because again, whenever the symbol is given, you don't need to write that. So 28 is final exam, and uh, they're using capital letters here, but you don't need it. Uh, these are uh, just uh, common nouns, so you can write with a small f, final exam. 
the one really tricky part here with this one is I've seen students just write final. Okay. Uh, if you write only final, do you think that you're going to get that wrong or right? So if you just write final and you don't write the word exam, is this right or wrong? Yeah, Violet Newman, I think you're just asking me that question and I'm talking about it. So do you think the examiners will give you a correct mark or a wrong mark if you only write the word final? Yeah, it's wrong and uh, it's logically wrong because we don't know what final. So final could be a lot of different ideas. Final project. Final paper. Final presentation. Okay, so there are a lot of ways to finish that collocation. So final what, right? Exactly. So it has to be exam to get that correct. Yeah, it has to be exam. Because it could be a final essay, final paper. Yeah, so it could be a lot of different concepts. So you have to have that. Um, so again, that's the type of uh, mistake or missing information that you want to make sure uh, you don't have uh, when they give you that 30 second or 20 seconds to look at your answers or review your answers. That's your second chance. Okay, um, here we go. Number 29, how long should the first assignment be approximately? Uh, no more than two words and or a number for each answer. So uh, let's brighten up our day here now that we're through that part with the Okay, uh, 1,500 words, says Kalitun, Rajvir agrees. Um, Preeti, Yogi, yep, 1,500 words. Yeah, and in this situation also, you have to have words, okay, uh, because we don't know if it's words or characters or paragraphs or pages. Uh, that might sound crazy, 1,500 pages would be a very long <laughs> first paper, but you have to show the examiner that you caught words. Now, if the question's different, so it says how many words, if it's more specific, how many words should the first assignment be, then you could write just 1,500. But there is no word in the uh, question, so you have to write 1,500 words. And of course, it has to be plural because we can count words, okay? Um, Izmir is asking, can we write 1,500 words? So can we do it like that? No, you'll get it wrong. So if you write 1,500 words, you'll get that wrong because it's two words and or a number. Well, actually, sorry, my bad. Yeah, you can because of the and. Two words and a number would be 1,500 words, okay? So you can. Yeah, in this case, you can because it's and or a number. So two words and or a number, uh, because of this and, they would accept 1,500 words like that as well. But I don't suggest doing that. Um, it's just much easier to write two zeros than 100. Okay, so you could, but it's unnecessarily complex. Okay, all right, students, let's keep rocking and rolling. Uh, we have one more question remaining. This question is called an inference type question. Okay, so when you see this kind of format in your IELTS, then you know that you're looking at what's called an inference type question. Okay, so inference type questions require you to listen to several pieces of information in the audio. By the way, these exist in the reading section as well and draw a conclusion based on what you hear. Be very careful with these types of questions. They are usually aimed at the band 8 and 9 level. 
Okay. So uh, inference means to make an educated guess based on facts. Okay. So inference, it's a verb usually. It can also be a noun. And it means to make an educated guess based on the facts. If the wind is blowing. It feels cool outside. The skies are dark. And there's a lot of humidity in the air. I can infer that it will rain to make an educated guess based on facts. Okay, so let's take a look at this uh, inference uh, type question, okay? So the student's class ends at 10.30 a.m. on the day the paper is due. Decide whether the paper is handed in on time or late. Write the correct letter A or B next to question 30. A means that the student receives a late penalty, B means this essay is on time with no penalty, okay? So the paper is handed in at 5 p.m. the same day, dropped off at the department office with no time stamp received, okay? So is it A or B? And the correct answer here is A. And the reason why is because there is no timestamp. And the professor clearly said if you drop the paper off after the class, make sure to get a timestamp so I know it was handed in on the same day. Okay? So it's this no timestamp that gives you the answer that the uh, student will receive a late penalty. If the student were to have a timestamp, it'd be okay. If the student handed it in before noon, it would be also okay. But because it's 5 p.m., it needs a timestamp. Okay. So, Hamant, that's right. The professor mentions that this timestamp is mandatory if it's after the class. Okay. A timestamp means that uh, somebody at the office would put a stamp on it, like, um, so uh, Aisha is asking, what does it mean, timestamp? So if I put my paper in at 5 p.m., then somebody at the office will have a stamp. They'll turn it to 5 p.m., and they'll stamp it, that it was handed in at 5 p.m., okay? It's just like a date stamp, but with the specific time. Uh, students do remember that... Um, uh, in the U.S., Australia, and Canada, uh, the agreed time is quite a bit more serious than in many other countries. So uh, whether in school or in work or even between friends, uh, 5 p.m. is 5 p.m. It's not 5.15. It's not, sorry, I'm running late. Um, it's quite strict in these countries for the schedule. Canada maybe a little bit more than the U.S. even. Okay, so uh, be careful. I've seen a lot of international students losing all kinds of marks because they're not paying attention to uh, being punctual, punctual meaning on time. So careful, careful. Okay, uh, let's do number uh, or uh, part four of the listening. Again, students, I'm going to uh, play the audio uh, please don't write your answers into the chat. Again, you can see that some of your classmates get upset when you do that. So just wait uh, until uh, the audio is over and then we will go through the answers together. Okay, so uh, let's do this. I'm going to hop back to the website contains all of our audio. I think there's over 70 pieces of audio for you to learn from on the website. Again, if it's quiet for you, turn up the volume. Uh, use a headset. Here we go. Everybody, three, two, one. Uh, just give me two seconds. I'm just going to... Here we go. All right. <clears throat> so, here we are. Now turn to section four. Take some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Listening section four. You will hear a lecture about the dinosaur Tyrannosaurus rex.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good evening, class. If you are registered for Anthropology 322, you are in the right place. Today, we will be talking about the most famous of all dinosaurs, Tyrannosaurus rex, or T-Rex, as it is commonly referred to. This dinosaur has a fearsome reputation, mainly due to popular culture films and books. In this class, we will be discussing the facts regarding the Tyrannosaurus rex, as opposed to its Hollywood depiction. Tyrannosaurus rex lived from approximately 80 to 65 million years ago. Of course, the reason it died out 65 million years ago is the same reason all of the dinosaurs died out at that time, a massive asteroid which hit the Earth and destroyed almost all life. The period in which the Tyrannosaurus rex lived is known as the Late Cretaceous Period. This reality is in contrast to fictional portrayals, which often cast the T-Rex as living in the Jurassic Period. In fact, T-Rex did not come to be until 65 million years after the end of the Jurassic Period. Tyrannosaurus rex was a meat-eater, but it is not entirely clear whether it killed its own prey or if it merely scavenged the prey of other dinosaurs. In our minds, we imagine T-Rex fighting to the death with other dinosaurs, but it is not known for sure whether this is the truth. Tyrannosaurus rex was a large dinosaur, not nearly the largest, mind you, but still large by any standards of modern day wildlife. The dinosaur's length was approximately 12 metres, its height could reach 6 metres, and it weighed anywhere between 5 and 7 tonnes. That weight is the equivalent of about 80 average sized human beings. If humans had been around back then, we would have been the perfect size for an afternoon snack. The location of T-Rex fossils discovered is very interesting. They have been found in Western North America, as far south as Texas and as far north as Alberta. And they have also been found in Eastern Asia, mainly in Mongolia. How is this possible? How can fossils be found in such different regions of the world? The answer is what geologists call continental drift. The continents have not always been in the same location. They have shifted and around the time of T-Rex, Western North America and Eastern Asia were connected. This explains perfectly the discovery of the fossils in the different locations. One of the more well-known interesting facts about Tyrannosaurus rex is that it had extremely short arms. They measured only about one metre long, which is very short when you consider the size of the dinosaur. To put such small arms in perspective, it would be as if humans had arms that measured only 10 centimetres. What use would they be? Well, that is one of the questions that has led scientists to believe that T-Rex was a scavenger and not a predator. It is very difficult to believe that it could have been an effective predator with arms being so important for hunting. Another fact that leads scientists to believe T-Rex was a scavenger was its extremely strong sense of smell. This enabled T-Rex to smell carcasses over long distances, giving it a big advantage as a scavenger. On the other side of the argument, T-Rex had very large serrated teeth, which would have been perfect for tearing through the tough skin of other dinosaurs. If T-Rex was a pure scavenger, it may not have required such teeth. Another interesting point about their teeth was that they were replaceable over time. Unlike humans, who grow only two sets in a lifetime, T-Rex's teeth could be replaced over and over throughout a lifetime. Again, this is evidence that they were, at least in part, likely predatory. That is the end of section four. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. And again, students, check your answers, pay attention to instructions typos and spelling mistakes. All right, let's do this together. One question at a time. So here we go. All right. Uh, section four, questions 31 to 40, question 31 to 33. Choose the correct letters A, B, or C. This is multiple choice for 31. Which of these events happened 65 million years ago. Again, logic will uh, help you here. 
the uh, professor is very clear on her answer. So uh, is it A, 1 and 3, the dinosaurs became extinct, Tyrannosaurus rex died out? I mean, that makes sense, so that's partially correct for sure. B, all of them, 1, 2, 3, 4, uh, the dinosaurs became ex extinct, Tyrannosaurus rex came into existence, Tyrannosaurus rex died out, a large asteroid hit the Earth, or C, Dinosaurs died out, T-Rex died out, and a large asteroid hit the Earth. Yeah, C, perfect. C is very good. Okay. Um, bonus question. What is the first record of uh, T-Rex? So uh, when did the Tyrannosaurus Rex come into existence according to our records? Let's see how many of you caught that one. Eugen, C was a good answer. So when did they come into existence? Derek says 80, 80 what, Derek? 1980s? During the time of the late disco era? T-Rex, 1980. Uh, Hemant, thank you for the full answer. Hemant says 80 million years ago. Uh, Yvraj Rimal, also 80 million years ago. Students always use full sentence expressions, okay? So 80 million years ago, okay? Uh, I know in everyday language, we would just say something like 80, but even then I think I would actually say 80 million years. Um, so um, Yalin, that's right. Uh, disco with their short arms. Absolutely. Um, so, um, yeah, um, use, uh, use full, full, full expressions, especially when you're preparing for the IELTS exam, okay? All right, good, good, good. So they were around for about 15 million years. Hey, that's not bad. We have something to prove as humans. It always amazes me. Humans, we think we're the best thing that ever happened on Earth, but think about it. T-Rex was around for 15 million years an animal that existed for 15 million years, and some animals like crocodiles for much, much longer. So us humans, we've been around for a very short time in comparison. Okay, um, 32, that was just my anecdote. Uh, 32, Tyrannosaurus rex lived during which time? Now, for these multiple choice questions in listening, you should always uh, think about them as statements. Tyrannosaurus rex lived during the something period and that's what you're listening for okay uh, don't just stare at the answers hoping uh, that the answer will pop out uh, try to catch the right answer so jurassic late cretaceous late triassic period correct answer is b late cretaceous okay um yeah the hollywood movies jurassic park and so on, um, they say Jurassic, but that's wrong. That's not science. That's Hollywood. That's a movie, okay? And uh, probably the reason why they call it Jurassic Park is because it just sounds good, okay? I think more people want to see a movie called Jurassic Park than if the movie is called The Late Cretaceous Park. They probably did like a group test. Hey, what do you guys think? If we call this the late Cretaceous Park, are you going to be excited to see the movie? And people will be like, uh, what, the late what now park? So that's why they called it Jurassic Park. But it's not accurate. The T-Rex lived during the late Cretaceous period, right? Yes, that's right, Hemant. Hollywood also says that the Avengers exist. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, next one. How tall was the Tyrannosaurus Rex? So how tall was the T-Rex? 12 meters, 6 meters, 7 meters, A, B, or C? Yeah, for those of you answering B, you're correct. 12 would be absolutely massive, so 6, still very big. Um, they don't use the word tall in the audio. They use the word height, had a height of. Okay, so you're listening for that paraphrase. Another way to say tall is height, and that's what uh, she said instead of the word tall. Uh, they were 12 meters long, and the professor said a length of 12 meters. Yeah, that's right, Hemant, absolutely. Okay, 
So 12 meters was the length, which makes sense, right? I mean, if you think of the T-Rex, <laughs> it's my uh, drawing of the T-Rex, excuse me uh, for this drawing. Um, and uh, yeah, so the uh, tail, right? These dinosaurs had really long tails to balance. So 12 meters and um, serrated teeth, okay? And uh, little, tiny little arms. That's my T-Rex there. All right. Let's keep moving along. I hope that makes sense. Again, students, if something's not clear, you're unsure, you're like, what is this guy talking about? Uh, check the transcripts. Okay, check the transcripts. Izmir, I'm happy that you like my T-Rex. Okay. All right. Um, question 34. Write no more than two words, so no more than two words here, okay? Always pay attention. These instructions change so much. You really have to pay attention. The theory which explains why fossils are found in very different regions of the world is called what? What is the... It's continental drift. Very good, yeah. Uh, now, some of you are writing it with big letters like this. And some of you are writing it with small letters. Now, here it's kind of interesting. Uh, I think both of these are correct. They would take both. Uh, it's called, so you're naming the theory, so capitalization is okay. But technically, this is a common noun, so continental drift. It's just an adjective noun, so you can use both. They will not take marks for that, so they'll give that to you. Uh, for both of those, okay? Uh, again, if you are really freaking out, then you can go with all capital letters. Just make sure that you don't make a mistake, okay? All right, and then question 35 to 40. You have to fill a table, so complete the table below. Write no more than two words for each answer, which is kind of tricky here because you really only needed one word, and this helps you right here, okay? So this is why you really want to pay attention to the instructions. Tyrannosaurus rex, predator or scavenger, okay? And then when you look at the table, you see that here you have scavenger predator conclusion. So you can figure out that these ones at least are a 50-50, either a scavenger or predator. Okay, extremely something arms. We laughed about this and boomy, shut bar, asror. Um, you're all telling me that it's uh, short, which is correct. Just give me a second. My camera just had a moment. So I have to restart my camera here. I think it overheated. Here's my little daughter when she had tiny little short arms as a three-month-old baby, not as a T-Rex. But indeed, she too had short arms in that picture there, just like the T-Rex. Relatively longer, though. All right. Get the camera back here. And we'll breathe life back into the image and continue with our table. So uh, short is correct. It's a common noun, ladies and gents. So just short. Of course, spelling is important. Okay. All right. Now, um, the animal has short arms, this uh, T-Rex. Uh, arms would be important for hunting, especially being humans. We feel that way. So what's the conclusion? It's a scavenger or it's a predator? Predator means it's a hunter. Scavenger means it looks for dead meat, so animals that have died. So 36, predator or scavenger? Yeah, and the correct answer is scavenger. And students, when the answer is given to you, please make sure the spelling, okay, is the same. Don't make a silly mistake and lose a mark, all right? So arms are important for hunting. If we have short arms, we're probably just looking for food, right? Okay, uh, strong sense of smell, able to detect carcasses from long 
37, I think you can probably guess that one. 37, what is it? That's right, Boomy. It's distances. Good job. Distances. And interestingly, here we use the plural. That's kind of the tricky part of this. Not long distance from long distances. You can actually count distance. So you can have multiple distances, which is an interesting idea. And sometimes English is weird like that. Uh, but it's plural, long distances. Okay, and when you have a C, you'll have that E, distance, uh, z, right? Uh, large serrated teeth. Serrated teeth means they're kind of jaggedy like that, like a shark. Okay, so sharks have serrated teeth. Um, if you have a knife and the blade of the knife is not smooth, but instead the blade of the knife is like this, often when you have a bread knife, it'll be like that. This is called a serrated knife. So serrated, serrated knife has this kind of thing here. And it's able to tear through tough skin. I see a lot of people answering skin. That's great. Okay, make sure you're paying attention to my extra little gems and jewels that I'm dropping for you here. Okay, you should remember that vocabulary. Now, uh, with these sharp teeth like a shark, uh, 39, we can conclude that the T-Rex was probably what? What was the T-Rex? Scavenger or predator if it had these big chompers? Probably a predator, that's right. And again, the word is given, so make sure you spell it correctly. Okay, number 40, this was a kind of an interesting one. It's a noun, teeth, so this is an adjective. Um, what was that? So what was the adjective? What kind of teeth did it have? Last one, number 40. Good job hanging in, by the way. Replaceable, that's right, replaceable, replaceable. Replace and able. So replace subble. Okay. Replaceable. So the teeth fall out, it breaks. Hey, no problem. Just like my little baby girl with her baby teeth. Hey, they're replaceable. New ones will grow in. All right, at least once. Okay, students. So those were the answers. Add up your scores. Add up your marks. If you were here in yesterday's class and you did part one and part two, then you can now add up all of your scores from part one, two, three, and four. And you can tell me what you got from 40. So what was your score from 40? This is what's called your raw score in the IELTS. So your raw score, what was your raw score? Your raw score is then converted into your band score. It goes into your band score. And you can check that, students. You can check your band scores on our uh, website. I'll show you where in just a moment here. I can see some of you are already throwing up your scores, which is great. So let's jump to, sorry, I should have, let me go back you won't be able to see that. Okay, so uh, I'm just gonna darken up the screen here because I'm backlit, of course, with that short throw projector. So let me just darken us up and then you'll kind of see what, uh, what's going on here. So at the bottom of our websites uh, here, there's a score calculator. Okay, you see that score calculator. It looks much smaller when you see it on your screen. Uh, and uh, here you will also see it in the uh, general. This is absolutely free. You can use this even if you don't create an account or whatever. Um, so there is your score calculator there at the bottom in the general. Now, if you're doing the academic, please use the academic because it works differently. So we click on that score calculator and then we get to this pretty little page here. And then here you see uh, listening. Uh, let me just erase my scribble. So you see.
that listening uh, out of 40 academic reading because it's different for general reading, the conversion. So if we go here, and I caught some students' uh, scores there, so don't worry, I'll go back. Uh, let me see here. So, bum, bum, bum. Okay, uh, Saminder Kaur said 33. So, Saminder, for 33, you would get 7.5, okay? Um, Kiran says 34. Uh, 34, still a 7.5, okay? I'm not sure where that cutoff is. Uh, Colored Tune says mine is 8.5. Uh, <laughs> okay, if you checked it, sure. Um, Nook Ravi says 29. Nook, 29 is a 6.5, okay? Um, just Preet, 36. 36 is band 8. Yeah, band 8.5 and 9 is a very, very tight little uh, area there. All right, and then let's see, a couple more. Sure, why not? Um, bum, bum, bum. Boomy. Shatvar says 32. 32 is still a 7.5, so that's good. Uh, 38 Rajvir is going to be an 8.5, and you're just one off of a 9. Okay, so students, a 9 is one wrong or less. So you need either a perfect score or just one mistake. That will get you the band nine. So Ali Dibaji, 39 would be a band nine, okay? Azima Piuli, 17. Uh, 17 would be a band five. All right, students, so you can check out your scores and all that on the website as well with all of those other goodies and uh yeah definitely a good idea to join our premium package i'm pretty sure that almost all students especially those students who use the website daily uh come back to us and say hey i got one band more or two bands more every day we get lots of emails with students saying hey i got sixth when i did the odds before i went to your website i did the work and i got 6.5 or 7. And we're really, really happy about those reports. Uh, you can check out those uh, success stories on the app or on the website as well. Uh, students, that's it for today. Tomorrow I will be back with uh, more live streaming. Um, we will have a uh, speaking part two class for everyone at this time. And just before that, uh, for members, we will have a Q&A question and answer session. So members, make sure to come and join for that class so that I can get lots of good questions from you and help clarify any confusion or misunderstandings about the exam. That's it for me for today. Again, students, aehelp.com for academic IELTS and G-I-E-L-T-S help.com for general. Sherwin Zhang, you are most welcome. Preeti Yogi member, you're very, very welcome. Much love to all of you from beautiful Budapest here in Europe. Bye for now.